about section 3 of chapter 19, the war at home. We're looking at how the war spurred social, political, and economic change in the United States. So we're looking not just at battles and tactics. This book explores the American story. Not just the story of rich white men, but the American story. The story of everyone. Not just generals and battles. But how does it affect us today? Because really that's what we want to know. Now, it is a common factor in wars throughout history that in a total war, that is a war in which an entire nation's resources are geared towards winning the war itself versus a limited engagement where a nation is only provided a limited amount of resources, uh, limiting the amount of involvement. In the case of the First World War, it is very much a total war. So that means the economy is going to shift from producing consumer goods to supplies related to winning the war. That means instead of automobiles, nations will be making jeeps or tanks. Instead of hunting rifles, Colt and Winchester will begin to make M1 Garands, the standard infantry issue firearm, in mass production. Also during wars, the chief executive, the President of the United States, tends to see a major increase in power. One of the reasons we have a president is because we need one branch of government that can act quickly and decisively and solve problems efficiently. And so the president gained a great deal of control over the economy, over the military, over the country. Now, the process of transitioning an entire nation of hundreds of millions of people from peacetime to war is a daunting task. No one person could do it. So the War Industries Board was created to be the main regulatory body overseeing which factories, which companies would stop making consumer goods and start making tools for war. They encouraged mass production. In fact, a new construction method was developed at this time, prefabrication. Ships were able to be built quickly by having many of the parts made elsewhere and shipped in whole pieces to the factories. Now, the head of this board was Bernard Baruch. And not only do we have the War Industries Board, we also have the Railroad Administration overseeing the uh, transportation needs of our military. We have the Fuel Administration making sure that we have the energy resources necessary, oil, natural gas, coal, etc. And then finally, the American public has to get involved. The American people were encouraged to conserve valuable resources, to eat less of certain products, to grow more of their food, to become more self-sufficient so that resources, resources could be allocated for the military. And so how do we convince the people to do this? A war has to be sold to the American people. And what better way to do this than through the use of propaganda? The cartoon that we're looking at here shows Uncle Sam stomping out German helmets. And there's several things I want you to notice about this as we begin to examine it. Number one, the German helmets have horns on them. What might, obviously some of them did have horns, but why do you think it would be important for an American cartoonist to make sure to draw these horns and emphasize them? What would a horn have in Judeo-Christian culture? What would that symbolize? The devil. The devil, yes. So I'll show you more examples of that in a moment. <laughs> Secondly, we see Uncle Sam stomping out the devil. Where? Where is Uncle Sam in this cartoon? D.C. At home, right? So the point is that the enemy is among us. In fact, what we see here is the word spy leading us to our... It is another fact in war that the economy is stimulated. Did you know war creates jobs? 
Somebody has to make the jeeps, the guns, the tanks, the planes. The movie Benjamin Button, his family was in the war button-making business. It creates all manner of jobs. It creates a demand for workers, which we'll get to in a few minutes. But I want you to look at that second bullet. Who are the real winners in war? Large corporations. Large corporations. If you don't believe me, look at how many corporations which profit from wars donate money to elections. True story. How many corporations which profit from wars have lobbyists in Washington influencing policy? Large corporations reap enormous profits from war. Other people do benefit from war. Unions tend to prosper during times of war because of the increased demand on labor. However, we often see um, corrupt hiring practices. Uh, for example, there were many critics of an increased amount of child labor. Pay equity was not even being discussed at this point. There was a severe difference in pay equity between men and women or whites and minorities. Now, there were still labor disputes, and um, Congress created the War Labor Board to settle these. As I said before, the American public would be encouraged to conserve. We would also see an increase in farm production. The trouble with this is that war creates an enormous need for goods. And the economic troubles we're going to run into with the Great Depression are how do we transition from a wartime economy where we have to make as much of everything as possible to a peacetime economy. And this is going to be one of the underlying causes of the Great Depression that we'll talk about later. Herbert Hoover of the Food Administration had posters such as this placed all around the United States encouraging Americans to eat more of these certain types of foods and to eat less of these others. The reason we were encouraged to eat less of these types of foods was because they can be non-perishable, they can be canned, they can be shipped overseas to the soldiers. And so if we can eat more of these things and less of these, the idea was that there would be more food for the soldiers. This is where it gets interesting to me. Now you see, the United States spent $35.5 billion on the war. And that's not adjusted for inflation. In today's numbers, I have no clue how much we spent on the war. It would be in the trillions. So where did we get all this money? trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars to send three million men overseas to fight in this war where 40,000 of them would die. How do we pull that off? About a third of the money came from taxes. We raised the money. We paid cash on about a third of the war. But the other two-thirds of the money, we had to borrow. Borrow from who? Do we go to China and we say, China, 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 can we please go kill some Germans? Please, 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 please. No. Who do we borrow the money from? From you. The American people, on average, every American family contributed roughly $400 to the war. Every single American family, on average, contributed $400 to the war. And that's not adjusted for inflation either. $400 in 1918 is an enormous sum of money. Every family contributed roughly $400. How did America convince people to make that kind of financial sacrifice? We had to sell the war. It's important that you understand what propaganda means. <clears throat> 
Of course, we studied it. Of course, you're exposed to it daily, constantly. Propaganda is biased communication designed to influence people. Propaganda is biased communication designed to influence people. Propaganda is biased communication designed to influence people. The reason I repeat myself is because it's so important that you understand that. It's so important that you understand that all information is inherently biased. All information is inherently biased. When you watch the news, regardless of how factual the site is, they've had to choose what they deem to be newsworthy. The corporation in which you're watching the news, be it ABC, Fox, CNN, MSN, NPR, etc. These are businesses. They rely on your viewership. And you may say, well, I get my news from the internet. They rely on you clicking on their sites for advertising money. And so they have to draw you in. That's why headlines are so important, are so provocative, because they have to make you click on that site. Otherwise, they don't get advertising dollars. In other words, news agencies have to sell the news. They have to attract your attention. As Hearst once said, you furnish the pictures, I'll furnish the war. They hoped a war would happen, so it would be easier to sell newspapers. Now let's translate that to the government. The government has to sell the war. Two-thirds of the money have to come from the American people willingly contributing money. And there were no Powerballs back then. So otherwise, we have to willingly loan the government money. And we did. So we put one of our best media guys on it, George Creel. And he was head of the Committee on Public Information. He produced visual works. He pr printed materials, posters, and propaganda. He had these Minutemen, people who would travel the country and make short speeches to raise funds. He put Sergeant York up on the stand to sell war bonds. He put Captain America up there. There's no real Captain America. But he put people like him, war heroes, movie stars, actresses, singers, anybody who could possibly sell these things. He put them up there. And so now I want to show you some examples of propaganda. This is a classic one. Let's start by just looking at the face. Well, can you tell me about this face? Yes, ma'am. It looks determined. Looks determined, okay, certainly. Yes? It's green. <laughs> yes, his face is green. He's not the Hulk that I know of, but um, so far we have determined look. Scary. We have the color. We have the feeling. Scary. What else do we notice about the face? Yes? Oh, I was going to say the helmet. Ooh, the helmet, yes. Now, what about the helmet again? Horn, of course. What's the horn mean? Devil, Devil right? Yes. Yes, this would be the Lusitania. This is a reminder to Americans that they killed innocent people. American blood and American soil, right? Uh, so, back to the face. Anything else that we want to notice? Okay, yeah, well, it kind of looks like Hitler. The mustache, perhaps. Um, how about, yes ma'am? His eyes are kind of like death stare. Ooh, good point. The Smash. eyes. Beady little eyes. Sinister looking face. Elongated nose. Would you say this man is attractive? No, right? We're personifying the enemy here. So we have to demonize our foes. So that we hate them. We have to feel that hate strongly to want to contribute to the war effort. Now, I want to draw your attention to the words. Defeat the Kaiser. Who's the Kaiser? Well, the leader of the Germans. Kaiser means Caesar in German. So Kaiser is the leader 
Uh, we personify, we simplify the enemy down to a person. Defeat his U-boats. Now I want you to read the subtext. Victory depends on which fails first, food or frightfulness. Will we give in to fear? Will we let the devil beat us? No. We called the Germans the Huns, which to be fair, Hungarian is part of their ethnic makeup. But when you hear the word Hun, what does that remind you of? Yes. Attila the Hun conquered the Germans, the bloodthirsty barbarians at the door of the greatest civilization of its time. The Hun. You got to beat the Hun. I want to point out another common factor of war is anti-immigrant hysteria. During times of war, People find themselves in fear of those who resemble their enemy. Xenophobia is common in times of war. Exactly. Very comparable to what's happening now. So let me give you the old timey example. My great grandfather was a recent immigrant from Germany during the First World War. He knew better than to speak German out loud in public. German immigrants were afraid of even playing Bach or Beethoven. They were even afraid of speaking German over the telephone because these communications could be monitored. I've got some crazy examples for you in just a moment. Now, suppression of a culture, sadly, is not unique in times of war. In this example, the Espionage and Sedition Acts mandated that a person could be fined or put into prison for interfering with the war effort, for speaking out against the war. Now, it's one thing if an individual spies or commits sedition. Sedition is very similar to treason. It's betraying your country. It's harming the war effort by putting soldiers in harm's way, by leaking sensitive information which might endanger our boys in the field. That's sedition. Espionage is, again, providing this information. However, sedition can be loosely interpreted to saying things against the government to speaking your mind in a way that is seen as unpatriotic. Now we hear this and we say this is a violation of the First Amendment. Well, the Patriot Act was passed in your lifetime and it does something very similar. You see, under these laws, governments have been able to prosecute people for loosely defined anti-war activities. For example, Eugene Debs ran for president as socialist candidate for the United States four times. The final time he ran was in 1920. He was put in prison for criticizing the draft, saying it was immoral to cause people to fight if they did not wish to. He also made statements to the effect of this war was started so that corporations could reap enormous profits. And he was not wrong. However, the, under the Espionage and Sedition Acts, he was placed in prison. And I've got more examples of this in the next clip. But now I want to show you another cartoon. You see, labor leaders were also often prosecuted under this, simply for saying that workers should be paid a living wage. IWW here on this worker's shirt stands for Industrial Workers of the World, one of the largest national labor unions in the United States at this time. This cartoon is trying to suggest that the American worker is out to kill capitalism, branding them as communists. 
Many labor leaders were also put in jail during the First World War simply for speaking their mind. Once war was declared, conformity, patriotism, and complete support for the war were demanded of all Americans. Freedom of speech and thought was becoming unacceptable. Different language and culture, suspicious. German Americans in particular were scrutinized and their loyalty questioned. Schools dropped German from their language classes. German books were withdrawn from public libraries. German measles was renamed Liberty Measles, and sauerkraut Liberty Cabbage. Frederick Stock, the distinguished conductor of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, was not allowed to conduct, and many other orchestras refused to play the music of Bach and Beethoven. Soon, these sentiments manifested into anti-German violence. The most notorious case occurred in Collinsville, Illinois, when German-born Robert Prager was lynched. Intolerance spread beyond German Americans. William Harding, then governor of Iowa, made a brash proclamation. Conversation in public places, on trains, or over the telephone should be in the English language. People who spoke Dutch, Danish, Norwegian, Swedish, and Czech, on top of those who spoke German, were affected. Elderly women were jailed for speaking German over the telephone. A Lutheran pastor was imprisoned for preaching part of a funeral service for a soldier killed in the war in Swedish. His explanation that he did it because the young man's grandparents couldn't speak English did not sway the judge. Governor Harding even maintained that God did not hear prayers that were spoken in any language other than English. In June of 1917, Congress passed and President Wilson signed the Espionage Act and 11 months later, the Sedition Act. Under these laws, a person could be fined as much as $10,000 and could be sentenced to as many as 20 years in prison for anti-war activities, like interfering with the draft or with the sale of government bonds. Imprisonment could result from saying anything disloyal, profane, or abusive concerning the war effort. Despite the fact that these two acts violated the First Amendment to the Constitution, the right of free speech, the Supreme Court upheld their constitutionality, claiming that there was a clear and present danger to free speech and a free press during a war. The result was that citizens were harassed purely upon suspicion. Walter Matthey was jailed for the high crime of attending an anti-war meeting and contributing a quarter to the cause. Under the act, the post office could censor the mail, and over 400 periodicals were banned for a time, including the Saturday Evening Post and the New York Times. Robert Goldstein ran afoul of the law with his film, The Spirit of 76. It was just a silent movie about the Revolutionary War, and of course, the British were portrayed as America's enemy. Now, however, America and Great Britain were allies, and Goldstein was told to remove scenes of British soldiers shooting colonists. He refused and was sentenced to 10 years in a federal penitentiary. Goldstein served three years and his career never recovered. But the worst treatment under the Espionage and Sedition Acts was reserved for socialists and labor leaders. The founder of the Socialist Party and frequent presidential candidate Eugene V. Debs was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment on each of three counts to be served concurrently for his outspoken opposition to the war. I have been accused of obstructing the war, I admit it. Gentlemen, I abhor war. Undaunted, Debs ran for president from his jail cell in the Atlanta prison in 1920 and got almost a million votes. In 1921, President Warren Harding commuted his sentence. Emma Goldman, an anarchist, a person who believes there should be no government, was fined $10,000 and given two years in jail for denouncing the draft. On her release, she was promptly deported to Russia. Labor organizer Big Bill Haywood was convicted of sabotaging the war effort because he encouraged workers to strike for fair pay and decent working conditions. 
Haywood received a sentence of 20 years for his troubles, but jumped bail and fled to Russia, where he remained until his death 10 years later. On President Wilson's last day in office, Congress repealed the Sedition Act. Ironically, while American soldiers fought for freedom in Europe, freedom of speech and civil liberties were being denied to Americans at home. So, the scene I'm about to show you next is a scene from the movie 1984. The book, written by George Orwell, shortly after the Second World War, describes a world which has been given over to totalitarianism. A world in which Big Brother is watching. That's where the phrase Big Brother is watching you comes from. It's from his book. A movie was made about it in the year 1984 starring John Hurt. It's an excellent, it's a powerful film. It is rated R. There is one scene, very brief, but inappropriate. You can't watch it in here. Speak to your parents before you watch it. However, it's a, it's a very moving film. And what you're about to watch was a daily occurrence in his society. It was called The Two Minutes of Hate, where individuals would watch a screen with the enemy on the screen. And they would go and yell and shout profanities and curse at the screen every day. And the citizens were watched to ensure that they were truly angry at the character on the screen. And if they weren't, they could be hauled off and executed. Read the book. At least watch the movie. It's an extremely good book. It's a challenging read, but I think you can handle it. But it's one you really got to dig in on. It's not it's more complex than your average short story, but it's good. It's worth reading. Now, the reason I bring this up is that when we get to the Second World War, I'll be able to show you some examples of where this has really been done. In our country, they were called Hiss and Boo films, where Americans would go to the movies just to yell at the Nazis. True story. And we do this in our own way today. We are encouraged. We are expected to hate to some degree. But even as we grasp at victory, there is a cancer, an evil tumor, growing, spreading in our midst. Shout! Shout! Shout out his name! 
Another aspect of war, a positive one for once, is that it can be an impetus for social change. The First and Second World Wars were very much a catalyst for the civil rights movement. W.E.B. Du Bois of the NAACP urged African Americans to support the war and hoped that this would strengthen the call for racial justice. How old was he at this point? Well, he founded the NAACP in 1909. I uh, don't know exactly how old he was at this point, but he wouldn't have been that old. Uh, he was still the acting president of the NAACP. Uh, he was the first African American to receive a doctorate degree from Harvard. Uh, but I don't know his timeline. Now, most African Americans did support the war, serving in the armed forces, even in segregated units, even for lower pay than white soldiers. They weren't even allowed in the Navy or the Marines, but they did serve admirably. And this war did lead to a great migration. War does many things to a country. For one, it creates jobs. Many of the industrial cities in the Northeast were hiring, which created a pull factor for minorities. Minorities knew they could find jobs in these areas where um, employers desperately needed workers. There was also the push factor, where African Americans were experiencing high levels of discrimination, animosity, and violence in the South. And so many wanted to flee, to get out of the South. It was unsafe. So the first bullet here is the push factor to escape racial discrimination. And then here is the pull factor, the job opportunities up north. Of course, before any American soldiers were able to fight in World War I, the United States had to get troops and supplies to Europe. The costs of such an operation were staggering. To raise money and get the resources needed, the United States government implemented extraordinary measures. First, the federal government took control of the economy and gave the president the power to fix prices and regulate certain war-related industries. President Wilson next established the War Industries Board and appointed millionaire financial expert Bernard Baruch to head it. Wilson often called him Dr. Fax because of his ability to assemble, coordinate, and distribute details about war materials and production. Every man has a right to be wrong in his opinions, but no man has a right to wrong in his facts. No detail, however seemingly trivial, escaped his scrutiny. Baruch noticed that 8,000 tons of steel were used each year to make ladies' corsets. He asked American women to give up that fashion in support of a war. They did, and the steel saved could be employed to build two battleships. The board encouraged companies to use mass production techniques to increase efficiency and eliminate waste. It also established price controls, allocated raw materials, and told manufacturers what they needed to produce in order to help the war effort. As a result, industrial production increased by 20%. Other government agencies controlled the railroads, regulated the use of coal and oil, and mediated labor disputes, avoiding crippling strikes. The War Industries Board also created a massive publicity campaign, encouraging the public to contribute to the war effort by planting victory gardens and observing meatless meals so food could be sent overseas to the troops. Gasless Sundays and lightless nights soon followed. My Tuesdays are meatless. My Wednesdays are wheatless. I'm getting more eatless every day. In order to conserve energy, the War Industries Board even adopted an idea first championed by Benjamin Franklin, daylight savings time, to take advantage of the longer days of summer and use less electricity. And finally, to raise the 33 million cost of the war, the government took two actions. First, it established an excess profits or war profits tax on corporate earnings and higher income taxes on wealthier citizens. Taxes were raised on tobacco, liquor, and luxury goods as well. These actions collected about one-third of the money needed. 
The rest was raised by appealing to Americans' strong sense of patriotism. Liberty bonds were sold. These, in essence, loan money to the government to fight the war. Movie stars and newspapers, parades and billboards all carried the message to buy bonds. Amazingly, on average, every adult American lent the war effort about $400, a large amount at the time. Even with the money necessary to fight the war, the government realized they would need the popular support of Americans, most of whom had been either neutral or openly against involvement. Therefore, President Wilson appointed a former muckraking journalist, George Creel, to head the Committee on Public Information, our nation's first propaganda agency. Creel was a giant when it came to advertising and public relations. He called his committee the world's greatest adventure in advertising. Creel convinced the best writers, artists, musicians, and advertising people of the day to help him sell the war. From booklets and books for Americans in various languages to anti-government propaganda messages for our enemies. Creel even got into the movie business with features such as Under Four Flags with the help of famous film director D.W. Griffith. These pro-war movies were not only hits, they actually made money for the cause. $852,744. Remarkable when you realize that it only cost a nickel to see a movie back then. Simply put, Creel helped make an unpopular war popular. His masterstroke was the creation of a national force of 75,000 men who would deliver a patriotic four-minute speech anytime, anywhere. The four-minute men spoke on the draft, rationing, bond drives, and victory gardens. By the end of the war, they had delivered more than seven and a half million speeches to 314 million listeners. Musicians gave voice to the war. Songs like, Till We Meet Again, It's a Long, Long Way to Tipperary, Keep the Home Fires Burning, and Over There, Kept American Spirits High. Meanwhile, the immense task of transporting troops to France began. After years of relying on foreign vessels to take American goods overseas, America's supply of ships was limited. Consequently, shipyard workers were exempt from the draft or given deferments to make shipbuilding a priority industry. A new construction technique called fabrication, a process by which parts were built elsewhere and then assembled in a central shipyard, substantially reduced the time needed to build ships. The system worked and worked well. In a single day, appropriately the 4th of July, 1918, America launched 95 ships. Rear Admiral William S. Sims decided that the best way to get troops and supplies safely past the German U-boats was to use a convoy system. That meant that merchant and troop transport ships would cross the Atlantic in large groups, escorted by a guard of heavily armed destroyers and cruisers circling the fleet. The plan cut shipping losses in half. 100 submarine chaser boats and 500 airplanes were also used to stop U-boats from sinking ships bound for Europe. Remarkably, of the two million men who sailed to Europe during the war, only 100 were lost to U-boat torpedoes. General John J. Pershing led the American Expeditionary Force. Pershing believed in aggressive action in combat and was highly regarded by his superiors and the men he commanded. Black Jack, as he was popularly known among the troops, was understood to be fair, courageous, and a top-notch administrator. At first, American troops were employed mainly as replacements for European casualties. By April of 1918, Pershing convinced the Allies that Americans should fight as a separate army. We came American, we shall remain American, and go into battle with old glory over our heads. I will not parcel out American boys. Accordingly, American soldiers, called doughboys because of their white belts that they cleaned with pipe clay or dough, fought together under the command of French Marshal Ferdinand Foch. By now, the government of Russia had been overthrown by the Bolsheviks, led by Vladimir Lenin. And Russia withdrew from the war signing a peace treaty with Germany. This meant the Germans could now consolidate their army and concentrate on a single front. By May of 1918, the Germans managed to get within 50 miles of Paris. 
America had arrived over there just in time to help stop the German advance at Cantigny. A few weeks later, the Doughboys helped thwart the German attacks at Chateau Terry and Below Wood and Reims. In late summer, the Allies, with America's help, triumphed in the Second Battle of the Marne, and in September mounted offensives against Germans at saint mihiel and in the Meuse-Argonne regions, where 1.2 million U.S. troops fought. By October, it was clear the tide had turned against Germany and the Central Powers, as German troops began to retreat all along the front. The victory was not without devastating cost, however. All told, the United States lost 48,000 men in battle. Approximately 62,000 died of disease, and another 200,000 were wounded and needed immediate medical care. The army is only 12 miles away. I have Americans, English, Irish, and French, and apart in the corners are Germans. They have to watch each other die side by side. The cannon goes day and night, and the shells are breaking over and around us. I have to write many sad letters to American mothers. Thankfully, an end to the slaughter was not far off. Although on the home front, the effects of the war were enormous. From fines and imprisonment for those who opposed the war, to new roles for women and African Americans, World War I was proving to be a major turning point in American history. Now, many women served in the war as well. In non-combat roles, secretaries, typists, nurses, cooks, drivers, etc. And many women served at home as well. Industrial jobs, which would not have been previously available to women, but with the demand on labor and the shortage of male workers, many women were able to take jobs in heavy industry. Many women volunteered to work for the war effort. There was an active peace movement. Many women joined that as well. But the public reasoning for the passage of the 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote was their valuable contribution to the war effort. But of course, in we, reality, we know that the women's rights movement had already been going on for 70 years at this point. The Seneca Falls Convention dates back to 1848. The vote wouldn't occur until 1920. But nonetheless, the war gave the president the mandate or the political ability to grant women the right to vote. Sadly, the Spanish flu, known as the flu pandemic, the great flu, spread by soldiers in the trenches, brought home, killed more people than the war itself. 30 million people died worldwide. 